Welcome, everybody. Today, we have a special guest, Nori Niven. Nori, where are you right now? I am at our New World headquarters uh, in Dallas for Thousand Foot Squid um, production and post. And so where did the name Thousand Foot Squid come from? If we shut this off right now, and, uh, and I asked you tomorrow what the name would be, and assuming you didn't know before, you would remember it. So okay. we first off wanted to come up with something that you could remember, something that wasn't um, you know, too corporate or too serious. Plus um, the idea that, that we have a, a lot of different legs and a lot of different things from documentary to scripted to our traditional commercials to direct to client to music videos to uh, short films, you know, we really have been doing a lot um, over the past uh, year and felt like that the, the, the brand reflected that. So, yeah, very cool. So, so Nori, um, you got your start in show business as a magician. Do you want to talk about like the days of being a magician at Six Flags and, and how that sort of shaped your vision of the world and, and of show business? Sure. I mean, um, you know, for me, I grew up, my mom was an actor. My, my dad, um, you know, was a musician. And so, you know, it wasn't very far run for me to figure out that you could do this. Um, and for me, magic was instant. It was something where you could, it, you might be really good at a specific illusion, but if you could tell a story around the illusion, if you could build up suspense in the audience's mind um, and and, and create something really entertaining that way, then I think you've got a, uh, you know, a compelling, a compelling thing. It's just like film. It's music, it's drama, it's, uh, and it was a far less expensive process than uh, filmmaking at the time. Um, so, um, so do you want to talk about in, in your trajectory, um, you went to a very prestigious school where you learned filmmaking uh, at UT Arlington. And, and, um, but then you had this time when you were making these um, karaoke music videos. Do you want to talk a little bit about sort of what you did and what you learned during those years? Sure, sure. Um, yeah, we, we, uh, we had done, I'd done a couple of music videos uh, while I was still an undergrad. And um, those put me on a panel. <laughs> when I was in my 20s, uh, early 20s. And, and on the panel, there was a guy there who's like, hey, I got this contract um, doing these karaoke videos. And uh, we didn't know what that was. Um, and so apparently Pioneer Laserdisc was really trying to just sell Laserdisc players. And in order to do that, they wanted to provide content mm. for people. And so they had pretty good budgets. Um, you know, like a Friday we would get, okay, here's, you know, the Beatles anthology. So we need treatments on Monday. So we would all, we'd hand out the songs and we'd write like crazy over the weekend. We'd cast, we'd find fun locations. I'd get great deals at Panavision mm -hmm. and uh, built uh, great relationships with the film labs and colorists and camera houses and stages and, and talent agencies and stylists. And um, so we put a lot on the screen we wound up all being 35 millimeter. Um, we, gosh, we probably did a thousand of them, but you know, it was a lot. And and like coming out of film school, I mean, that's a pretty big deal to be able to shoot 35 millimeter film and get paid for it. Yeah, I mean, it, and we would come up with reasons to shoot in Paris or Hawaii. Or <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, I remember backpacking a bunch of 16 gear. And, uh, and going to Europe, you know, and booking models and stylists and, and just shooting, just being creative, you know, I mean, that's, that's, it was just, I, I compare it to like Arnold Schwarzenegger in Conan pushing that rock around in a circle when he's like 12 and then he turns into Arnold, like, you, you don't shoot a million feet of film and not try to, you know, you don't take something from it. So we developed a style, we developed, you know, a look, we, we developed a respect for our craft. Um, all completely outside of the system. That's the great thing about it. Mm -hmm. Like, like uh, the Galapagos Islands, we evolved as different kinds of filmmakers, you know, completely different <laughs> in a good way. It's mm -hmm. not that I didn't pay my dues in LA and I did that. 
um, right after that, you know, went out there and I got repped by a company and, um, you know, got to meet David Fincher and uh, Marcus Espel and Mark Romanek and Michael Bay and Zack Snyder and I signed at this production company the same day. And they gave us two Mustang HO rental cars and put us up at the Mondrian and, and, and we're having drinks and, and uh, Zach says, he goes, oh, Nori, what happens next? And I was like, if I'd had a time machine, Zach, um, you're going to be doing $2 million, uh, $200 million Batman and Superman films, you know? Mm. So, uh, you know, it happened pretty quickly, but um, then we came back here and have been doing commercials here for 25 plus years now um, and had a lot of love from not just this community, but from the nation, you know, we've been able to bring a lot of work back to Texas, which has been uh, fun and humbling and um, quite the adventure. So, so let's talk about the, the, the movie here, um, the movie which we, which we all, we all watched. Um, before you started doing this, how did you, did you do a music video for them first and that's how you got to know them? Or what, what was the story yeah. about how you got to sort of, you know, connect with these folks? Well, in the, in the 90s, you know, you're, you're writing a lot of music video treatments. Um, I did a, um, uh, I did a couple of music videos for a management company here. And uh, they signed, which Paul Nugent, Swin, Swinford, they, uh, uh, they signed Blue October. And they said, hey, we have this great new band. You've got to listen to this music. And. So I started writing treatments, but they were on Universal. So Universal, you know, they're going to mix your album in LA and, and you're going to work with one of four music video directors, period. And I get it. You know, I have a lot of repeat business because they can depend on me to deliver. So I get it that, um, you know, that the, that the four or five directors are going to shoot those music videos in LA. But it didn't stop me. I kept writing treatments. And every time they, they would send me a new song, I would write a fresh treatment. I kept all those treatments, by the way. Um, so we finally got to do a video and uh, uh, we, we, we did Fear. Fear got 13 million plus views already, that music video. And then we wound up filming a, a live venue show at the House of Blues, which was two nights. Mm -hmm. And uh, I only did that because I wanted to use those components for the, for the film because Justin's story was so unique and so amazing and riveting and, um, and in inspirational that I felt like that story was worth me committing um, eight, 10 years of my life, you know? So first of all, how did you get to know the story? Did he tell you the story or did other people tell you the story of his life? Oh, no, it, it, it didn't take long. Um, you know, we'd go to a live show and, and we'd be talking to Justin and, and um, you could tell he was completely messed up. Um, um, and then, you know, the management was like, well, we, you know, um, he's saw an antidepressants or he's dealing with anxiety and this, that and the other. And, and then sure enough, um, you know, he had some really severe addiction issues. And um, and lucky enough to, you know, have uh, have filmed some of these interviews directly right out of rehab, like like weeks after he left uh, rehab in Nashville, uh, where he'd been for a few months. Um, so that was fresh. <laughs> Those interviews were really raw, and the emotions were on the surface for the whole band, and you see that in the film. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. So, yeah. so how did you convince him to do this documentary? Justin would, would say the following, um, that the fact that there's a film crew, the fact that I'm following him around, the fact mm -hmm. that we are, are documenting his life, um, whether it's in music videos or on tour with him, helped him stay sober. The fact that we were there to watch in case he screwed up, you know, huh. um, that was a component. I mean, one of many components, obviously, you know, with the 12 steps, um, mm -hmm. but we put uh, Bongani, who you recommended, um, I called Bart, I was like, Bart, I got to find someone who's quiet, humble, artistic as heck, uh, who I can put on a tour bus for two months because I was doing commercials and I couldn't go out on tour with them as much as I wanted to. And, uh, 
uh, Bolgani went out with them on tour and they loved him. They just adored him. You know, he had his own bunk on the bus and he filmed everything. Um, and we wound up getting a really cool trailer out of that footage. Hmm. But I, I knew it wasn't ready. Nothing was quite ready. Everything was very raw. And we were experiencing Justin coming out of rehab and truly, really trying to find himself and mm -hmm. find his light. Um, one of the things that I just really love and admire about this film and ab about him is the the show that he did where he basically tells his story. Um, and and um, I mean, there are several throughout the film, you have a bunch of really key interviews where he sort of really talks in, in a very honest way. And I think a way that most musicians are not as honest about what happened in their life as, as he did, which makes for, I think, a really good story. And it's very important. And he is open in a very profound way. So we want to talk about like, did, was that his idea to do? Is that your idea to do? And and um, because it's it's just so compelling. Uh, thanks, Bart. I mean, for me, Justin's unique in the rock music world. Um, uh, you got the Rolling Stones, and they're going to write a song about a girl, or are they going to write a song about a moment in their life or someone else's life? They're not necessarily. Um, autobiographical stories um, about Mick Jagger. In this case, all of his songs are autobiographical, everything. Into the Ocean is like when he was in his first marriage and they went on this cruise in the Caribbean and he was suffering from depression and um, went to the back of the boat thinking, I'd be a lot happier just jumping over the back of the boat and, and drowning in the sea. So he writes a song about it. Um, and that we talk about that in the film, uh -huh. um, and it became a huge hit uh, for Universal. It became a huge hit. So that that seemed super interesting to me. That not only is he writing about himself, but he's also performing on stage, you know, in in front of uh, hundreds of thousands of people, and then he's um, on the radio at the same time and talk shows, and then just completely implodes from the pressure. Um, we were walking up the canyon wall in Malibu the, the day we shot the fear video the morning we shot that video and and we're coming out and I was like okay Justin uh what are you going to do now buddy you've got sobriety on your side you found God and you've got this huge fan base what are you going to do so um he started writing more hit music and 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 preaching and some of that we caught, you know, from fan videos, from uh, mm -hmm. phone videos. We had thousands of hours of footage, eventually other, other things, obviously, that we didn't shoot. Mm -hmm. And it had to follow a theme. So I wrote a three act structure and uh, each act uh, had its own uh, so arc. When in the process did you, did you develop this three act structure? I mean, after shooting for a year or two or, um, did you start this before you started, you know, shooting and having Blancami go out on the road? Uh, no, we had to continue filming. There were so many components I needed. Um, I needed to get each band member alone in their homes. I mm -hmm. needed to get uh, management alone. I needed to get, you know, I needed to keep beating Justin up. I went, I met him in Salt Lake City for a show. It was just a sound man and myself in a, in a hotel room. Mm. And just in that intimate space we got so much amazing material from justin so every time we would interview every time i would sit with him it wasn't like the other family members or the other band members mm -hmm. justin was like an onion i kept having to peel and get down to the core mm -hmm. and it evolved it evolved from when he was super sensitive right out of rehab to years later i mean i lost the film for about a year there was another guy that came in and shot a ton of interviews with the band and he put himself in the video all the shots had himself interviewing the band it was crazy um but that, hey, that, that is so crazy how, how did that happen well um i think he's a radio uh dj and mm -hmm. uh and i think he was offering to finance to to finish the video mm -hmm. to finish the film rather and uh um at the time i you know i, I couldn't fight that you know 
I mean, we we were in the middle of reinventing ourselves and mm-hmm. putting our money into our company, um, and um, I couldn't fight that. But I did have a really amazing feeling about it. I thought, okay, this is what I need. I need someone to come in and give me what I need, which is another year. And it did exactly that. I told my sweet wife, uh, Melissa, I said, look, this is, this is going to work out because they were going to come back because I had a lot of parts to the Ferrari that were sitting on the floor <laughs> and no one could figure out how to put it together. I knew that. I knew that. Um, and so ultimately, you know, I got invited to come back and finish the film and uh, you know, it worked out great. And there are no shots from the other uh, director. So, so how, how was that like being asked to come back? I mean, it reminds me of the scene in the film when they're kicked off the label and then they're asked to come back. Yeah. I I did not act like Justin did with universal. (laughs) You you didn't, you didn't like create a song or create a video where you said, fuck you to them. No, we're, we're all friends. We're all friends and family. You know, I I think they understood. And, um, you know, we, we, uh, we, we got back to business and it was great because we had time for things to mature and for um, some feelings to, to not get healed and for other feelings to be healed. And, and we got better perspective, much better perspective over the entire career mm. at that point. So I want to go back to this, the, to this show where he's solo by himself and sort of telling his story. How did that evolve? Was that your idea? Did you talk him into it? Did he say, I want to do this thing and come in? Because it's very rare that you get in in a music film, somebody to in front of an audience sort of tell their story in that way um, with an acoustic guitar and sort of, sort of take you through it. It's just, just amazing. Well, um, you know, like your, your old friend, uh, Andy Anderson or, uh, uh, gosh, uh, Larry McMurtry would say, you want to start there. I think, I think for me, uh, that I personally cut that scene. Um, and we got uh, Eric uh, and Justin to give us a piece of music that had no vocals on it. And we laid it over that, um, which was fan, which was uh, user generated, you know, fan source footage. Um, and then we, to me, that anchored the whole thing. That's him coming back in talking to his audience. If you go look online, go to IMDb, look at the comments about the film. Go to go watch the fear video on YouTube. Go look at the comments. We lost uh, a cinematographer last year who uh, died from cancer, who was going to the to the music video every day and commenting. Like I, I'm watch, I watch the video every day. This is my source of healing. This is my source of healing every day, every day. And the comments on that fear video will make you cry. They're just so powerful. And there's so much healing that Justin's been able to give these people who need him. You know, people mm-hmm. suffering from opioid addiction and um, bipolar disorder and have lost a family member or a friend. I lost my father this January, about a week or so after Justin lost his father and, and Jeremy lost their father. Um, and uh, I remember going to that video. I remember watching it and listening to the music and, and having my own you know, little spiritual moment. Um, so I, that's what it's all about. That's what the film's about. That's what his message is about. Yeah, it's, it's honest. It's not, you know, it's not, it's not cookie cutter. This isn't Nashville. I mean, this is uh, bare knuckles, tatted up sleeves. Um, complete honesty to the fan base and you hear it in the music you know it's yes, very I mean, early in the doc you have um i think it was his father saying when they were selling merchandise somebody who looked like a football player coming over not the kind of person you would think would talk about um these issues and talk about how how does he know how does he know how, it's, how does he know how they feel? So it's like in terms of the sort of structure of the film, that's sort of the moment where you understand that he has this unique ability to connect. It's true. Um, and that, you know, those, those themes, you know, I had to fulfill. I had to let you know early on that he had problems with depression and his mom was aware of that. I had to let you know early on 
he had a power over his audience. Um, you know, the, the hysterical story uh, about Black Orchid, the song he writes in high school, mm -hmm. band members, and he thinks, oh, I've written this amazing song and I got to perform it. And then they had an intervention the next day and kicked him out of the band um, because it was so, so dark and all about suicide. Um, there's a great, yeah, great moment. We've seen Justin repeat that many times about his dad waking him up saying, Justin, wake up. What'd you do last night? <laughs> He's like, dad, I, I should have been there. there. Yeah. <laughs> if you had been there, you would know. You would know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think he said when he finished the song, everyone was just, their mouths were open and they weren't even applauding. He was like, oh, great. I killed. This is awesome. So, you know, it's a sort of pedestrian question. How long did you shoot this film? How many, I mean, this is, this is not just a year or so. This is, this is a long process. Uh, overall, you know, about seven, eight years off and on. Um, we, you know, we, it was like baking a, you know, a, a beautiful meal, a, 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 a beautiful cake. We, we, we took our time with it. We got the right ingredients and, you know, when it was done, it was done. I think that, um, you know, that would be the one thing people have asked, are you, would there be a sequel or is there another film? And I was like, no, this is, this is it. It's its own story and it has a beginning, a middle and an end and we're done, you know? Um, so I, I, I didn't finish, I didn't, we didn't stop to start editing really until we were completely done. Even though I remember we ran a trailer for the film at a concert where we were filming those interviews with the band, which is so premature to have a trailer already <laughs> to, to show it for the, for the fans, but they loved it, you know? So um, I want to talk about like sitting down to start editing this because, um, you know, you're not doing this when you're sitting around doing nothing, you're traveling the world, shooting commercials and, um, you know, you have a lot going on um, yet. I mean, you had, you sat down, wrote the three act structure in certain, do you want to talk about how you see the three act structure develop and then how you chose an editor to work with and how you work with them? Well, uh, Ed, Edwin Harris and King Hollis, King Hollis has produced your credit and helped me shoot, you know, in so many of the interviews. Um, and Edwin, you know, just has a wonderful sensitive heart and, and, it didn't need a rock and roll editor. It didn't need someone who is dealing with the abstract, even though there's a lot of that in the film that we purposely used um, to try to help, you know, create this headspace for Justin. Um, but Edward's just got this amazing ability to find the nuance and the subtlety in, in the way he built the, the relationship between um, uh, Jeremy and Justin that, brotherly bond that he tells mm -hmm. in one piece of the film, as you're hearing Jeremy talk about the abusive relationship that was yeah. brought upon him. It's so moving and so touching. And to me, it's probably one of the most powerful moments in the film. Um, I'd never had a brother and I felt that attachment um, when I saw that scene in the edit bay. And so uh, Ed and, and uh, King and I basically hung out you know, for, for gosh, maybe two months, three months cutting it. Um, luckily we had the, the rough cut due from the Dallas International Film Festival. So we had, a, I had that deadline, which was so yeah. powerful uh, in communicating with the band and management, you know, to say, look, you have one day <laughs> to give me, you know, feedback uh, or we're not, we're not going to make the screening. And that caused an enormous amount of stress part. <laughs> Well, I, I know uh, my friend Mark says, you give me the blessing of a deadline. Um, yeah. That's easy to say after the, after it's over, but during the time you sort of, because otherwise, you know, these things can, you know, travel. So but how did you- answer your question about the themes. Yes. I'm sorry. And um, the themes, and then, and then how do you sort of, in a documentary, develop this three act structure, which is traditional for a narrative film, but in documentary it can be a little trickier. Yeah, I noticed there was a screenwriter credit on the Pat Benatar <laughs> documentary that uh, you invited me to see, which I loved. Um, uh, I didn't do I didn't do that on this. I would never have assumed that you know we we're going to have a screenwriter. But I get it that Pat Benatar probably needed to okay the 
mm -hmm. the, uh, the, the, the content. Um, but in this case, I'd, I'd shared it with uh, uh, Justin and, and management so they could see it. Um, and it was basically, um, it was a really simple structure about, um, you know, I, I, if, if it didn't fit the themes of recovery, if it didn't fit the story of his journey through addiction onto recovery and um, with obviously the power of love and, uh, and faith and all of that built in. If it didn't fit that, we threw it on the floor. So there would be like, why aren't we using this clip or why aren't we using that clip? And I could defend my choices by saying it doesn't fit the theme. We're not, this doesn't work. It's not helping us tell right. the story. As opposed to looking at a four hour edit and saying, oh, I've got to trim this down to 90 minutes. How am I going to do that? It worked out beautifully. Like we truly had three 30 minute um, acts to mm -hmm. just fit seamlessly together and, and, and work beautifully. Then we got to talk to the mob and play with some of the more abstract footage. And So one of the struggles in doing a music documentary is like, how much music do you put in and how much of a song do you put in? Because for people who like love the band, they just want to sort of experience the music and then but then it's like you have to sort of balance how much story you get in. And it seems to me here, you have enough of the music to understand what the lyrics are about and what the song is about because the story is so compelling and so critical to your understanding. Is that how you sort of manage that or thought about it or was that conscious or even just an unconscious way as you were going through and trying to find that sense of balance? Well, it's like going to a Willie Nelson show. You got to play the hit. So, you know, we knew we had to make sure all those top, you know, uh, 10, top 100 hits, you know, from radio uh, were in there. And King Hollis cut a beautiful sequence um, together of clips and music videos that sort of built upon each other. Mm -hmm. um, so for Hate Me, which was an incredible song. Mm -hmm. So we did have, you know, one of our, friends uh one of the fans had talked about it he's like you know watch the film but i don't remember the music in the film and yet if you watch it really it's wall to wall you know there it's it's definitely music driven um but yeah we i felt like we had to honor the songs but you hear those songs happening during the timeline right. so you hear them at different points in his life and the band's maturity and so yeah even all the way up to the very end where you know the very last song about their tour um, I hope you're happy, you know, played for the end of the film. So we, we, I think we did a pretty good job of that. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think it works well in that way. I mean, and for me, like I didn't, I didn't know anything about this band before I saw the film. Good. <laughs> and, um, so this was totally, uh, new to me and it's, um, there are some great music docs that you don't have to love the band to love the the film because the film is about an, an engaging person and in, in this case the subject is not just engaging but willing to bear his soul yeah i mean i mean strangely um you know this the, the film really is about the other people it's about his wife it's about his brother it's about his mom it's about management it's about the people that he hurt during his addiction. Um, and he is um, our muse, you know, he's who, who brings us from the beginning to the end. And he's electric, you can't not watch him, you go to a show, and just, you know, uh, you just watch him on stage, and he just draws the entire audience, you know, he's a very amazingly electric person. Um, it's also, you know, you mentioned the um, the the managers um, who are just compelling characters, and and you don't think generally that people who manage a band feel that deeply about who they're managing. I mean, when they talk about what happened in, in the baseball field, when they talk about what happens when they have the intervention. I mean, in each time when there's a really difficult situation, both of them, you look at their faces and you can see that this isn't just like a client who has a problem. This is a very 
deep thing. And I think they're two really fascinating characters. Yeah, if you, if you look at it, um, you know, Justin gets on an airplane to Minnesota. Um, he is messed up. I think he's connecting to another city for a concert, for a show. And, um, and he's sweating and he's walking off the airplane. And, and, and I think a security guard or police and said, are you okay? And he's like, no, I'm going to effing kill myself. Well, if you say that to a, you know, a police officer in an airport, they are going to rush you to a hospital, a mental hospital. And they did. Um, Paul gets on an airplane in the middle of the night, uh, flies to Minnesota, meets uh, Justin's mom there, and they try to extricate him from the state hospital that he's been put into um, to, to get him some, some healing time. You know, they cancel the tour and um, it's tip of the iceberg as far as, you know, how down, downward um, he, he went. Um, but that, that's how much Paul loves him. You know, they're, they're brothers, you know, hundred percent. It's not like a normal, you're right. Not like a normal relationship. And I think that's the power of Justin. You know, I think, you know, he can be incredible and delightful and hysterical and funny and charming. And one moment, uh, you know, he can go the other way, or at least he was, you know, he, he, he did at the time. You know, it's it, it's it's amazing how many times in the film he'll say, and we had to cancel the tour. And it's like, as though it's just like, oh, and you just had to cancel the tour. And, you know, what does it mean when you cancel a tour from the manager's point of view? It's like all these people have bought tickets. All, there's so much. That, and it's just sort of matter of fact. And from the manager to say that and not like, that goddamn just no we can't do that it's just like it's fine do what you need to do and that, isn't that, isn't that ironic that here they are healthy writing the best music of their careers with the biggest fan base yeah. and COVID 19 happens so they can't tour you know what i mean yeah. that that to me is the twisted messed up irony of the situation we planned on 37 city tour with the film yeah we were going to show the film at every city they were performing in um, so, you know, I think, uh, well, that, that, the COVID will be over the, yeah. tour, the tour will happen. They've already started. Justin's doing his one man show tonight, actually in Plano, he's doing a one man show, oh. uh, the open book tour. Yeah. I mean, that's the other thing is like the band is really good, but him on his own is, is also pretty compelling. It's, um, uh, it's a very honest experience. You know, he, uh, he talks about his life. He talks about, you know, things that are happening today, his nightmares, his relationships, uh, you know, the times he was abusing drugs and alcohol. And um, you really get a lot of that from the, from the one man show, but it's not a blue October show. <laughs> you go to the blue October concert, you're in for a treat. It's insane. Like no other rock concert I've ever been to. Um, so tell me about the um, the uh, the the sequence with the drugs that you came up with with the the um, the B and the and the and the, the dollar bill and all of that in which you set up this thing like near the very beginning the first time he sort of talks about drugs that then pays off like way at the end it's like you knew something was going to happen but it's like what is it with this B so is that your construct to come up with? You want to talk about how you started to think about how you visually represent these, these issues? Um, yeah, we're, we're filmmakers, you know, yes. uh, we deal with uh, abstract, but we also deal with things that uh, touch on your subconscious. You know, I think part of that's from my magician roots, you know, I like starting a story early um, and then finishing it later in the week when you're blown away by something crazy that happens. Um, so to me, that's what that is. It's me playing around with a timeline, um, giving you hints of things that you'll eventually understand when you see them. Um, and that I put that in the in, a, in the draft in our original draft. Uh -huh. um, shot of a B. It'll be shot of an, this. It'll be shot of that. You know, as we're going along. The x-rays of the broken leg all of that hinted that event when it happened you know um so yeah that that to me is that's what that's what i do <laughs> <laughs> right right i mean to me those were um 
Yes, those were visual expressions of noriness, right. uh, as opposed to the, the sort of, you know, performance material and the interview material, which are beautifully done. But those seems sort of special to me, those moments. Those are my opportunities to talk to your soul when there's a moment uh, of space, you know, so there's timing, there's a pause, and then I could hit you with some visuals and some audio to to, to treat you later on with. Like, I mean, um, uh, uh, you know, I mean, look at uh, some episodic shows, you know, like Breaking Bad, you know, we've got elements that are happening in the first episode, you don't even see until the eighth episode you know oh i mean he sets that up more than anybody else i've ever known he yeah. sets something up in the beginning of a show that you don't see for the next season just like yeah. just later on you you sort of like what was that thing with the pool oh finally we get to know that exactly so uh, yeah it's fun so um you know nori you spent a lot of time with justin and i i assume that you don't have heavy drug usage and yeah. you, uh, you don't, to me, as far as I know, don't suffer with depression. What was it like sort of hearing them from your own sense of psyche, spending so much time with somebody like that and hearing these stories? Well, you know, we've all had loss um, and we've all had trouble and we've all had challenges in our lives. And, um, you know, I, I get it and I, have had many friends and have lost friends, you know, several friends over the past decade have uh, perished due to um, alcohol abuse or drug abuse. And so, you know, I don't think you, <laughs> you live in the, in our world, Bart, when you're, you know, uh, having films shown in Deep Ellum or you're, you know, cruising around Dallas in the nineties, I think you, uh, you go to the Stark Club, you know, you're, you're, you're it's you're in tune with the drug culture i think especially in rock and roll and um um i feel like you know me being able to be empathetic with him uh was really important for me to get him to 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 be relaxed enough to talk about things um and and certainly how amazing right we there's another documentary that i won't talk about um about another um performer in another band who had come out of drug addiction and was being championed by a film about his recovery, mm -hmm. which came out right about when we finished editing our film. Um, so we all looked at that film. And then I talked to Justin about it. And he's like, no, nah, he's back. He's back on the pipe. Like he's doing drugs again. And it was well known among you know the bands on tour that this film had been made about this guy who eventually went back to doing drugs. So, um, you know, it's a powerful thing, you know, it's a powerful thing. I, I've seen a lot of documentaries about um, bands where they have drugs and depression issues. I mean, it, it's, it's almost a subgenre. Um, but, and and you know, some of them, you know, are on it for a while and, and back off of it. But the thing is that nobody is upfront about it in the way that he is which makes to me the film, you know, that much more uh, you know, compelling. I mean, his story in itself is compelling, but his, his honesty and his sort of openness is what tr truly makes it kind of, you know, transcendent as a music documentary. Yeah, I, I mean, again, that's who he is. That's, that's his honesty is in his music. It always has been since, since he was a kid. Um, and, and I think that that's a process for him. I think he has to be open in order to be alive. Like he, his, um, spirit is, uh, even though, yeah, he hid the drugs forever from everyone. Um, and even then he's still writing hit music. They, they sent an album to me when he was at the peak of his, um, uh, drug addiction. And I remember I was on a shoot in Chicago and I got the, I got the, uh, the, the, the album and, and I listened to it and I was like, holy crap, this stuff is dark. You know, it's about murdering your, your ex-wife and all this crazy stuff, right? Um, music he won't even play now. Um, and he's like, he says in the documentary, I was making the band learn the lyrics. They're like, come on, dude, <laughs> you know? Um, and 
it gets it just got dark but even then there's some really beautiful songs on that album hmm. um that they do play now so even at the worst part of it he was still able to you know to give hope to the, the fan base you know as king said it's like he's at the bottom of of this pit of despair and he's still throwing souls back out of the pit he's still saving people and giving them hope and and yeah he was lying and saying he was sober and he wasn't um but, not the uh, first person to do that yeah not the first right yeah you know it's amazing to me how yeah art, art many artists you know um have gone that route i mean look at them all right <laughs> so um did you get to were you involved with this during the first wife or, or is that like way before you started shooting and did you ever did you try to interview her or talk to her um it's a tricky that's a tricky tricky question because um uh, to me that um empowered the very thing that he was trying to deal with. So he had lost custody of his daughter from that marriage. And he really wanted to, um, you know, go after her tooth and nail with that album. And, uh, you know, she's, he's saying F you to the judge during the custody battle in a court, which is not good. Um, and, uh, and, and because of the drugs, he was blind. He just was in a fog and he didn't understand. And so uh, Sarah came in and she's like, no, we're going to, we're going to figure this out. You're going to get cleaned up. You're going to wear a suit to the, to go meet the judge. You're going to get these papers in order. You're going to figure this out. Um, um, so for me, I felt like, well, there were two reasons. I didn't want to talk to her. Um, I didn't want to, I didn't want to give any power to that situation. Uh -huh. it's, it's to me, it, it was just another part of the ongoing story. Yeah. Tour gets canceled, breaks his leg is in a divorce from the Vegas marriage. Um, I, and that was enough. I could just talk about it. I didn't have to go there. I didn't want to, I didn't want to go there because that then I would have been just as guilty as he was for writing this album of music against her and, and this, this, uh, this custody battle. It also didn't fit my themes, you know? Uh -huh. It was a huge story, but it didn't fit the theme of my, of my story. And so and, we walked and away from that. You couldn't get, permission to use her photos you had to blur them out or was yeah. that a directorial choice no we did we had to blur out his uh his daughter now he has custody now she lives with him now she's at san marcus academy where my wife actually went to high school um in san marcus so so how did that happen um i i, I don't know the details but it's a it's a happy ending it's a wonderful ending to a beautiful story uh it's, it's she's a sweet delightful wonderful young woman who's been singing with him during the pandemic and has an incredible voice. Incredible. Uh -huh. Yeah. You should look that up. It's a, I'll go to the, um, uh, get back up TV, get back up TV. And you can see some of those performances, those duos. I, I love how you introduced Sarah, um, like the, the, the first, like, you know, the people at the door and you get the towel and you snap and, you know, and then, and then you have this quick cut, Sarah, 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 like sort of signifying that this is a key moment in his life and a key moment in the film. And there's nothing else that you cut like that in the way that you introduce her before we see her, you set her up as an important person. You want to yeah. talk about that? Um, you know, they'll, they'll call it the crux of a story, the crux of the story from Christianity, the, 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 the cross, right? Mm -hmm. So without Sarah, there's no intervention. Without his love for her, there is no recovery. Um, they tell you to have a, find a higher power when you're in your 12 step program. Um, it's one of your early steps. And you hear Justin talk about, it. it's a key component to the film. If you don't have love, you can't find that higher power. If you don't have, you know, he'd lost his, his relationships with his family and his brother and um, all the people that cared a lot about him. And, and yet he found love. And because of her love for him, he was able to recover. And, and through that recovery did find uh, his higher power, you know? So, um, so to me, she, she is everything. I mean, that's, that's the, <laughs> she's the key to his being alive right now. I'm a hundred percent sure of that. 
absolutely 100 percent and they have two beautiful children as well um and what what was was she you know happy to be in the film i mean you know it's like i'm sure she's nervous about a lot of things and she clearly has a good head on her shoulders and um but you know when you approach her the first time what was that like well Sarah's amazing she's just a a, a delightful um delightful woman and um incredibly powerful force obviously but <laughs> remember me telling you about the, the film went away for a little bit yes so uh the other director had sat her down for an interview, like a two hour interview, and she didn't get a word in. <laughs> he talked the whole time, apparently, she told me. She's like, I was expecting something like that today when we sat down. She goes, I, he goes she goes, you've actually let me talk. I was like, well, that's what I'm here for. I'm here to have you tell your part of the story, Sarah. She was, she was, uh, she, she was wonderfully happy about that, that I didn't, uh, you know, sit and talk to her for two hours. So. Yes, I, I never really understood the um, the situation when you're making a film and you're interviewing somebody and you just talk, right? Yeah. And then somebody says, yep. <laughs> <laughs> so trick. it's a trick, you know, you want to try to get folks to emote, you know, and I've had the good fortune of being able to interview a lot of really cool people in my career and it's been about that it's just been about guiding them and, and sitting back and letting them you know so, so what is your secret other than just sitting back and letting them talk because there is there is a skill to getting people to reveal it depends um it really depends upon the person and the moment you know like with uh, uh jennifer lopez i knew the director who did the cell and so the moment we sort of started talking about him when I first met her, then she completely melted and was warm and was holding my hand during the interview. And it was like, she had, we had a connection. Mm -hmm. um, and I feel like it's, you've got to find that. I mean, clearly, you know, for, for the band members, they knew me from these music videos. So mm -hmm. there's an absolute sense of comfort. Um, and then I always make sure there's no one behind the camera that, that there's no eye lines that we, just have an empty space really so people feel super comfortable uh -huh. and uh can be themselves uh, to, to me it's it's there's a lot of different things like uh errol morris you know um has this interrogator system whereas a video camera uh that's focused on him that feeds a monitor that's on a teleprompter that sits in front of the lens so that the subject is looking directly into the lens yeah. but they're really looking at errol's face while errol's yelling at them from across the stage you know that's his technique. I, I have a much more uh, intimate sort of relationship with my talent that I prefer to be, you know, just really quiet and with them. And there's no slates, there's no action, there's no, none of that. We're, we just ease ourselves into the conversations and that's where the magic happens. I think that that's kind of important. I think um, Earl Mars is, he's made great films and, and his interviews have a specialness to them, but they're, they're sort of more intellectual than they are emotional oftentimes. And I think that um, being present in the room and connecting to their eyes as you're talking to people gets for something that I think is different than just sort of, you know, being in the other end of the room and having them look at you from the- Hey, you can't argue with his Oscars. He's um, the best, right? Oh, I, I don't say his films are great. I'd love his films. I think his films are really very powerful, but uh, they though that technique works for him. I Absolutely. don't think it can work um, for anybody else. So in, in the many years that you struggled, you worked on this film, I wouldn't say struggle with this. There always is a struggle when making a struggle. film. <laughs> And there is great joy in making the film. So what was the biggest struggle? What was the hardest thing for you to do? Um, I mean, it's not like you had a grant to do this. Financially, this was taking you away from other things that you could be making money doing. Um, sure. Um, yeah, I mean, um, money is always an issue. We had, you know, uh, luckily, um, you know, Alan Petchy and his wife, Bonnie Petchy, also UTA um, alumni, um, you know, we're there to support me just in case. Um, and then, you know, we, we had uh, great people and great crew and, 
we we were able to do things and the and the band helped you know uh, compensate um, for most of the expenses you know so so, so the band chipped in some that's yeah. management from the band absolutely yeah the band essentially paid for um, the hard costs of the of the uh, of the film yeah well that's a good thing yeah. they had a they had a um, a website originally where you could order pre-order the documentary and then it would mm. cover the cost of the expense of the making the film which was pretty inexpensive you know the total cost of the film's less than what it costs for me to go out the door on a single day for a tv commercial you know um so for me that's i mean it's really not a struggle i, I it's a joy to do to make art and it's a joy to be a part of this process um i i haven't complained once you know i mean it's just like um you know pushing that rock up the hill and and you just keep going because it, you're finding joy in the effort of the the effort of trying to make something of quality um, is always hard, um, mm. but, but great that you're getting a chance to do it, you know, with, with, a, with a great audience that was waiting for it, you know, it wasn't like we had to invent this audience. This audience is there. Yeah. The fan base is ready, you know. And, and, and I'm sure the fan base knows some of the story, but not all of the story. So it really kind of, you know, is something that everybody who loves the band will um, um, will want to see. So, what what has happened since this is over? What has Justin been doing after? And how is he doing with things? We talked well, a little bit about it, but yeah. Well, on Get Back Up TV, they they've managed to um, do uh, concerts that were streaming live. Uh -huh. You know, Justin will do uh, two shows a week, usually sometimes more. He posts quite frequently. Um, that goes live on you know, on Facebook and Instagram, and then you can go to the Get Back uh, Up TV, um, and uh, and you can you can, you can buy some of these performances or rent some of these performances, and they can stream in your home. Um, so he's been quite prolific, and they've continued to write music. Uh, really, I think they just released a brand new album, which is fabulous um mm -hmm. and then this new tour will be supporting that album that's coming up hopefully but how has he been like emotionally is, is he stable is he um is oh he yeah struggling? no um, very stable um i you know i feel like that the the film because of the film and us needing to premiere it on a streaming service and for them to create their own streaming service right for right. us to create our own streaming service so that the film is a platform. Well, on that platform, he was able to survive, you know, creatively, right. able to, to you know, showcase new music and to showcase old music. He'll cut, he'll do cover songs from other, other songs and other bands. Um, so it's been a fantastic creative outlet. So the film inadvertently, I think, helped rescue all the band and Justin during this, uh, during this crazy pandemic yeah so so nori what are what are you working on now as now that this is out in the world and um you know available to be seen um what what do you what do you got cooking on now oh wow uh well we're prepping prepping some really fun um commercial work right now um and and promoting our directors and creating um you know a new New sort of social presence for the company for this company um, and hoping to uh, begin building a world-class soundstage that we uh, have uh, property for in Dallas that will be the first real motion picture facility in the state of Texas um, complete with it why, why do you mean uh, the real one is are there some that are fake no uh, but you know and we love uh, we love our stages here but um, you know, the moment you step on to a stage at Warner Brothers or Universal, you understand the difference. You've got 200 foot main walls, 60 foot ceilings. Mm -hmm. The facility is uh, designed for creating motion pictures um, as opposed to you, know, you adapting the stage to your commercial, the stage facilitates and including a VR stage that we're developing from a oh, wow. uh, team from Mandalorian. Um, so it's an LED screen that 
can put you anywhere in the world without green screen or blue screen. And you can have camera movement that works just on the parallax with the screen and um, uh, Unreal Engine to help uh, support that. Uh, with uh, So that's one of the stages in the complex will be dedicated to that. And uh, one will be an automotive stage. We're hoping to attract uh, our friends at Toyota and Lexus into that facility. So, um, so that's going on, <laughs> but creatively, um, yeah, I'm developing, uh, I've got a really huge pitch uh, coming up next week. Next week. Next week uh, to uh, a very significant uh, feature film director or a sequel to a film that happened in 84 that um, by the title of Goonies. So uh -huh. hopefully um, this will go well. We were excited about the screenplay and excited about the project and then i've got a series that we're developing here uh hoping to shoot in town called olivia and the end of the world which mm. is um, hysterical and funny and huge our vfx budget is mammoth uh but we've got double negative the vfx team they'll win the oscar this year for tenant they've won for the past five years uh inception mm. and uh, you know all chris nolan's films uh, all the Transformers films, they've done all of that. So they're my partners on this, uh, this series. And, um, and it's, uh, it's, a it's a fantasy comedy series, but it's, uh, it's really good, really funny and different. Um, so that's happening. And then I've got a film that I'm excited about, uh, about the 1911 theft of the Mona Lisa, which is um, all about um, a, a con man who masterminded this theft. This is a true story. Who, so how's it going with that? I haven't heard that, you know, you talk about that one for, for the last few weeks. What's going on with that one? Um, yeah, I mean, we're, I'm hoping that the other two projects I just mentioned yeah. will help uh, catapult us into an uh, A-list cast. And, um, but I've got some great, great folks helping me with that project right now. So it's getting real. <laughs> well, Nori, thank you so much for, for spending so much time with us and talking about this and for making this film and staying with it for, for, for so long. Also, I really want to thank you for the studio that you're trying to build. I mean, just think about what this will mean for the city of Dallas in terms of people coming here to shoot and developing um, you know, talent in a different kind of way. And um, I think, um, you know, I think it will maybe shift some of the weight that's going down to Austin back up here. And I think the, the, the power of what that will do for the film community here and within the state is going to be just really powerful. We're super excited.